Got it. Okay. Um, thanks so much, Sarah. So um, I'm not sure that I've met everyone yet because it's even though it's partway through R2 year, but especially the interns, but I'm Leah. I'm an R2 in the primary care track as well as the women's health pathway, hence why we're here today. Um, and then for this portion of the talk, I um, wanted to do kind of more of a 2.0 since there's been some past lectures about both contraceptive as well as preconception counseling, but a lot of our patients have um, more complex diseases. So this one is more focused on a rheumatic disease lens. Um, and it's by me, but also a um, huge shout out to my mentor, Addie McClintock, who's also our pathway director. And then if I can... slides. Okay. Um, disclosures. I have none <laughs> whatsoever. No one gives me money. Um, the objectives for this talk um, are threefold. So number one, plan disease specific lab evaluation prior to pregnancy for patients with rheumatic disease. And then also know which adverse pregnancy outcomes are associated with lupus, RA, and other rheumatic diseases. And then to be able to perform a medication review to identify teratogenic versus safe medications for people with rheumatic disease. Our first poll, we'll see how this works of the, of the morning, is how do you feel if a patient in your clinic came in with lupus RA and wanted to talk about pregnancy planning? Okay. Most, so <laughs> similar to me, um, most people would say sheer panic. I'm ill-equipped, maybe a leading question. Um, but also some people um, are like, yeah, folic acid. And then also a little nervous, but I have the resources um, to be able to find the answers. But, and a couple of people are feeling pretty chill. Props to you. Um, I myself was not in this category. Um hopefully something reassuring. It's not the exact patient population, but there was a survey of primary care providers um, and talking about IBD patients. Um, and only 8% of primary care providers felt that they had the expertise to talk about family planning, which is a pretty low percentage. So if you're in letter D category, you're um, right with everyone else. But really the point of this is why, why we should, and we being internists, why should we be discussing pregnancy and preconception counseling? And I would argue there's many, many reasons, but kind of first and foremost is this unmet need. So um, there is, again, sort of a limited data set in what we're talking about, but there was a couple, there's this one more like large multi-country survey, as well as this qualitative survey out of UPIT that had some helpful information information. Um, in the larger study, they found that only 30% of patients with rheumatic disease had their concerns on these topics adequately addressed by a provider. It's pretty low. Um, and then also in several studies in kind of the discussion, they found that um, patients are reporting that their rheumatologists rarely address pregnancy planning or prevention, um, and their various healthcare providers, when they do, are giving inconsistent advice and counseling, kind of tying in that misconception and misinformation. And then patients want this to be happening. They're asking for it. There is, again, in this qualitative study, a quote that I really liked. You could kind of hear the patient's voice saying, I really think that as a female my age, I would expect that my PCP, my gynecologist, and my rheumatologist are all going to check in on that subject because, you know, that's pertinent to my real life right now and my real health situation. And it's like a big deal. It's a really big deal. 
The other thing I'll mention um, is again, like patients are wanting this and they're expressing concerns about it. Um, but in this misconception, misinformation realm, um, there's also data that anywhere from 30 to like two thirds of women with rheumatic disease are self discontinuing even safe medications when they become pregnant. Um, again, out of this fear and unknown and lack of counseling. And then these other aspects on the right here, these are things that we do every day as internists. Like we have the relationships with patients, we can manage complex medications, um, and again, kind of take in the whole person to, to best tailor our advice to them. So again, the hope is to kind of go from these two separate lanes saying, oh, well, isn't that room's, room's purview? to instead say, I can do this and I should be doing this. These two lanes coming together um, and really moving into this co-production. So our next poll, and I don't think you can actually check more than one option. So just select one, that's totally fine. Um, but to kind of get a sense of where everyone's knowledge is at is understanding the risk of pregnancy and rheumatic disease. So for this, which of the following adverse pregnancy outcomes can occur with lupus, RA, or antiphospholipid syndrome? And there are multiple right answers. I feel like I just channeled the spirit of step one. I'm probably very delayed on this chat. Okay. The poll. Um, interesting. Okay. So not surprising because you can only pick one very wide split, but most people um, chose fetal loss and miscarriage, it seems. Um, and then what else? And no one picked unplanned cesarean delivery. Okay. So basically all of them, except for subfertility. Um, however, there will be other asterisks in this presentation. Um, again, for it kind of varies by disease process, but any of these um, in this group can happen, except we really don't think of patients with rheumatic disease as being subfertile. There is some very, very weak evidence that in RA itself, that it may lead to subfertility. But again, this evidence is poor and it's most likely actually related to medications that patients have been on, not the disease itself. So the American College of Rheumatology does not include this in their most recent guidelines. Um, and again, fertile being like being able to conceive rather than um, miscarrying or a fetal loss and that which does happen um, in other diseases. So I'm a visual person. So using our little icons to kind of group these. Um, up in the upper left, we have our heart blood pressure cuff to represent hypertensive disorders of pregnancy as well as preeclampsia. In the center here, um, this fetus can't grow outside the circle. It's our growth restriction. This surgeon really wanting um, to cut, that's unplanned cesarean delivery. And then this EKG, I'm pretty sure does not show heart block, but is supposed to be heart block. And then alarm bells um, is here's the fetal loss or miscarriage as well. Um, so there is again by disease process, lupus, I will say is all of the above. Any of these can happen um, for patients with lupus. 
And the rates, again, vary depending on what study you're looking at, but it's anywhere from 10 to 50% of pregnancies um, that have one of these and up to 50%, again, are preterm and up to 30% have preeclampsia, which is pretty high. For RA, the rates are anywhere from like 1.4 to 2.2 times more likely to have really this top area. So the hypertensive disorders, um, growth restriction, and um, C-section here. And then for antiphospholipid syndrome, really think about the physiology. So it's essentially most of these over here, because if you're thinking about what's actually happening, if there's these little clots, then you're getting a lack of placental blood flow and nutrients. So you're not able to grow as well or um, constricting that vasculature and causing high blood pressure, things like that. For lupus, some, again, some special considerations in this um, population. So knowing if someone has a uh, has a history of lupus nephritis is super important um, as represented by our kidneys over here because their individual risk, if they have this history, and especially if they have active disease, doubles those already high rates of adverse pregnancy outcomes. Um, and then here, our flame is our flares. And this, I think, is something that I didn't truly really realize before putting together this talk is that I think there's this messaging that for all rheumatic diseases um, in pregnancy, it's this immune quiescent state. So everyone should get better. And that's actually not true um, for, again, it varies on what you look at, but flares happen anywhere from like 25 to 60 percent of patients rather than the background flare rate is 30 percent that's in contrast to ra where that is more of like the traditional messaging um, most of the time um, folks get better in pregnancy okay so now that I um, shared all of the things that make pregnancies a little bit higher risk in this population, um, how do we bring it up? How do we talk about this with our patients if it's not something um, that we do all day, every day, like in guy? So I, if you haven't already heard, I think universal intention screening is super important. And one of the ways that's been pretty well studied is called one key question. And the key question, like that phrase has been trademarked, but the question itself is not, which is, would you like to become pregnant in the next year? And I'll say, this is something that's really best if included as part of um, an intake form or like rooming process, um, fits really well into a wellness visit. Your first participation. Um, and really want you to think about like phrasing that you might use. Um, how might you incorporate this into your own practice and visits? If so, you saw that someone had checked this off on a form or asked them this question, how might you um, further develop that conversation? Nice. We've got some open-ended phrasing. I see what you said. Yeah. Yeah. Tell me more about that. I noticed you checked this box. Would you mind if we took a moment more to talk about this so I can best support your goals? Love that, Nikki. So patient-centered. Okay. I'd be remiss if I didn't give you some examples myself. Um, one thing I, I find I use the phrasing actually a lot is my job is to keep you as healthy and safe as possible in meeting your goals. Um, sometimes if, you know, there's some uncertainty expressed, you can normalize saying plans can change um, and then open up further. Do you think a pregnancy fits into your personal plan plans for the future? Okay. But as promised, we're going to get a little bit more into the meat of, let's say you've opened that conversation. They've said, yes, I want to get pregnant in the next year. Um, I don't really know what I need to know, where to start. Um, I'm here to give you a little bit of a framework. 
So the things I want everyone to think about specific to this population will be um, thinking about disease process risk stratification, lab screening that you would need to get or want to get, a medication review, and then pretty much always thinking about if a MFM or maternal phenol medicine referral is appropriate. A little triadogen refresher, because this will come up in medication reviews. Um, I think another poll for this one, again, I don't think you're able to choose more than one, but there is more than one right answer. Uh, so which of the following would be considered safe in all trimesters of pregnancy? I picked one. I think you can actually see that from my screen. Okay. So the things, the common things that people picked, it sounds like a lot of people picked hydroxychloroquine, prednisone, um, and then a couple other stragglers were, I don't know if I can count correctly, um, looks like cyclophosphamide, azathioprine, and sulfasalazine. Nice. So, okay, um, which ones are considered safe? So the ones that are not safe are the ones that are crossed out, which is the mycophenate mofetil or MMF, as most people would call it, cyclophosphamide and methotrexate. Methotrexate, I think, is the one most commonly well-known. Um, and this, I think if anyone did my needs assessment, one, um, misconception that came up is that is hydroxychloroquine. So this one is something, um, is really important to call out because if patients are on that, this is actually encouraged. It's not only like safe, it's, it has benefits. So specifically for patients who have the, um, anti SSA or anti SSB antibodies, um, this is helpful as, as far as showing decreased incidence of neonatal lupus, as well as decreased incident, incidence of congenital heart block. So you want people to be on it. And then azathioprine, I think, is tricky in its messaging because it's previously been classified as an FDA class D or X, but is actually wildly considered safe. Like rheumatologists will switch people onto that medicine. Um, so I think important if we're doing um, med reviews to have the correct information. Um, the other thing that, oh yeah, so some resources that I wanted to give you guys with. Um, my two favorites here are mother to baby and then micromedics. So down at the bottom and then kind of upper right. I think these mother to baby is the most patient facing. Um, so if you wanted to pull something up in the room to be able to look at it together, I think that's your best option. Micromedics, I also think is very accessible. You don't need um, a specific login. Terrace and Reprotox, I think if you were doing this all the time in your practice, are great resources, but you do need to create a login. It is free, though, with your UW, um, your UW email. Oh, and Sarah, Infant Risk, I've not heard of this, is also great and is an app, but has a small fee. Okay. Some of the best things do have those small fees. 
Um, but I think to get more into the active learning, um, this is one we'll break up into some small groups for doing some cases. They're pretty short. So I think they're in, we'll be in breakout rooms of about eight, um, and have each group do one case. I think if they're about eight, we'll have at least six groups if my math is correct. So maybe if, um, groups one and two do case one and yes, awesome. Sarah's putting this into the chat so people can download it. Um, but yeah, so one and two do case one, groups three and four do case two, groups five and six do case three. And then if you're any other number, just pick whatever case you want. And if you get through one, then go on to the next one. Um, and we'll come back together and talk about them. There's only six rooms, so there will not be a set. <laughs> Amazing. Everyone has a case. Okay. So you're going to be in great rooms for about six minutes and away you go. Thank you. Wait, everybody's away in their groups. I guess I could have joined a room, but whenever, I don't know. I feel like whenever like a leader comes and joins, I feel so weird about participating that I wouldn't want. <laughs> I get it. We'll just I have totally. if you want to, so I can put you in one. I'm good. <laughs> Absolutely. I think, yeah, when you're the facilitator, it's definitely, um, it, it can be kind of like a weird, <laughs> yeah, like a <laughs> yeah, you're like, so what do you think? I have, I have my answers. <laughs> Is that Are we still Lindsay? Yeah, that's Lindsay. Yeah. <laughs> Lindsay, do you want to join the breakout room or do you want to stay here? <laughs> oh, um, I will, uh, maybe I'll stay here for a moment. Cool. Um, <laughs> hello. Sorry. I've been kind of <laughs> in and out this morning. No worries. Um, recording I developed my first like URI symptoms in three years. Um, oh no. And, uh, they're super mild, but, um, I'm like doing the PCR kind of dance and, uh, anyways, um, <laughs> I hope you feel better. I just got over. COVID. <laughs> what was that? I hope you feel better. I just recovered from COVID last week. Oh gosh. Oh, I'm sorry, Javel. My taste you feeling better now? has recovered as well, which I'm happy about. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. I feel better. Thank you. I feel, I feel absolutely fine. It was one of those things where it's like symptoms are very mild and it was just like, I was like, oh, maybe these are my allergies. And then my partner who does not have allergies was like, huh, like, I wonder if I'm having allergies. And I was like, you don't have allergies. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> so I don't know. Hopefully all is okay. But that's why I've been kind of in and out because I've been like going into employee health and then coming out. But I really wanted to hear this talk. So <laughs> yeah. What? So what, what uh, are they talking about in the breakout rooms? They're doing some cases, some case awesome. learning, if you will. Love it. Love it. That's awesome, Leah. Yeah. Um, How are you all been this morning? It's good. Yeah, it's been great so far. Good discussion in the chat. Leah, I hadn't um I haven't heard about the mother to baby website before. I'm just looking at it on my phone. That's oh, and of course it like won't show. The <laughs> It's neat. I like that. It's like, yeah, it's like very um, patient centered language. Yeah. The infant risk app. I like it is like, it's like a one time you have to pay 10 bucks to like make an account with it. But what's kind of yeah. cool, like I use it a lot in clinic when people are, especially um, for people who are lactating because it has like by trimester and then it also has lactation. Cause I feel like a lot of the resources I see, you know, it's like pregnant and breastfeeding. And it's like, those are two very physiologically different things. Totally. Um, yeah. So for example, like it'll show, so like here's sertraline um, and it'll show like by, uh, oh, it's, I'm, I don't know. 
it'll show like what its category is by trimester and then like by months post um birth as far as like oh, so nice it, it is designed for healthcare providers but i've like shown patients for example like here's what this you know what this looks like as far as safety so it's a nice i like that it has that like little visual like quick kind of like snap look and see like okay is this safe or not but i wish it was free yeah but i i actually i feel like if it's just a one-time thing somehow that makes it better um because like I'll, like i'll pay for like the ASCCP app because i use it all the time um and honestly i would probably use that all the time too in my future practice Mm-hmm. I'm going to write it down. There it is. Hey, my um Zoom crashed. <laughs> <laughs> no. what, what room were you in i was with case one case one so room one javel i i i think so yeah. <laughs> who, who was in your room with you uh becca was there marina was there room um one. okay I'll great okay. i'm gonna send you back here we go nice yeah. i did it you did it <laughs> <laughs> More based, tech savvy than me. <laughs> Zoom skills that I'm still learning. <laughs> and it's February. <laughs> oh. All right. Break I down. still feel like I'm like always relearning Zoom. Yeah. That is. It's one of those use it or lose it type of things. Um, so if you don't do it very often, then I forget things too. <laughs> um, but breakout rooms are closing. They'll be back in 30 seconds. Oh, nice. Thank you. Okay, so as people are trickling back in, um, let's see if I can figure out. Yeah, people are still coming back, so I'll give it a second. Um, but if oh yeah, it's come, the numbers are speeding up. Okay, so I think it's time. Um, so for for case one, if someone um from either groups one or two wants to read the case, um and kind of include the the chart review and brief history and then just kind of go over their I guess conclusions to the questions because they're all pretty similar I can read it Thanks. Um, so Ellie is a 23 year old woman um, uses she her pronouns with a history of uh, lupus complicated by lupus nephritis who wants to discuss pre-pregnancy planning um, on chart review and brief history. She was hospitalized for lupus nephritis about eight months ago um, and when asked her nephrologist told her that her kidney function had stabilized at last visit, which was about three months ago. Um, she's a progester in IUD currently, um, but it's set to expire in about a year and she's never been pregnant before. Medication-wise, she's on hydroxychloroquine, 200 milligrams twice a day, and prednisone, two and a half milligrams daily. Um, so the three main questions that we that were posed to us, um, the first one was when would be an optimal time for her to conceive with regards to her disease activity. Um, our group felt that most likely when her disease is like pretty well controlled. Um, which it seems based on the chart review brief history that um, it is her kidney function was stabilized about three months ago. She was last hospitalized eight months ago related to the kidneys, but those have hopefully been stable since then. Um, so we felt like if she was hoping to get pregnant, um, now might be a good time. Um, but we want to make sure that her disease activity is actually kind of controlled right now. Um, the second question was additional lab workup. Um, our group had talked about kind of like just all the routine labs we would get for someone with lupus, like an ANA reflex panel. Um, we also discussed the idea of like an SSA and SSB. You had mentioned increased risk of like congenital heart block with those um, and then antiphospholipid um, panel as well. Um, 
And then referrals that we would consider were like an MFM referral because she's got a complex medical um, problems going on. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yes. So I have some slides to kind of um, confirm basically a lot of what you said. Thank you, Becca. So kind of going through that framework again, the first thing um, you want to think about for all your patients is this disease risk stratification. So yes, um, like this um, boat in very still water, you want disease to be quiescent, um, just like you said, Becca. The, um, I would say key thing for lupus and specifically with lupus nephritis, you want at least six months of being well controlled. Um, and because we know that the lupus nephritis is kind of this extra risk factor, um, I would say you'd want to make sure that their kidney function is stable for at least six months, like use that as your framework, but of course, having them check with their nephrologist as well. Um, as I'm not sure if we'll specifically address it later. I can't actually remember. Um, there's no set time frame in RA, but again, the general thought is you want the disease to be quiescent, um, to set them as best up for success. And then lab screening. Um, I didn't give you a ton of information beforehand, but you read my mind, which, so there's kind of like these three categories I think about, um, and they're different shades because in this light purple, I would argue that those are things that really the rheumatologist or subspecialist is likely monitoring in the background, but like we're able to help facilitate. So just like you said, like thinking about the disease activity, um, in lupus, they'll often check complement levels as well as the anti double stranded DNA, just using that part of the ANA um, to risk stratify. And then also, like you said, evaluating for organ function. So thinking about your CBC, the liver function, renal function, and then um, kind of as a tangent from that, the urine as well. But I would say if you're going to take away one thing from what you could do as a generalist it would be the risk stratifying labs for pregnancy. So just like you said, getting that anti-SSA and anti-SSB, because that will directly impact if it's positive or negative, what you do in pregnancy care. Um, and then also the antiphospholipid panel is recommended for every patient with lupus, regardless of disease severity um, before pregnancy. Okay. And... Hey, Leah, can I ask a question? Yeah. What? I was just trying to see if there was a question in the chat. Go ahead. <laughs> Most rheumatologists are checking an antiphospholipid when someone's originally diagnosed with lupus. Like, is this part of the usual workup? And if, if it has, is there utility in rechecking it before pregnancy or is usually that status? Like it is what it is. Um, such a good question. So, um, you, I will just jump ahead and say for I know you didn't ask, but for um, SSA and SSB, once it's been positive, positive for life um, is how you're going to treat it in thinking about pregnancy. For antiphospholipid syndrome, it seems um, pretty uh, patient specific on whether or not they've already checked it or not, but it is in their recommendations, like close to conception or early in pregnancy to recheck it. Um, again, like if they have, if it is positive, um, you like to confirm the diagnosis, then you need a second set. So you would want to get that if they hadn't already, but if they already have a, the diagnosis, you don't need to recheck it again. Did I answer the question? Yes. Um, okay. Um, then going on to case two, will someone from groups three or four read this and then kind of walk through it? I can read it. Um, Tess is a 34 year old non binary person, uh, AFAB, they, them pronouns, with a history of RA. They are hoping to become pregnant in the next year and wanted to check with you about what they should be thinking about. Okay. And does someone else want to say what else we know about them and then what? their questions and answers were. Mm 
Yeah, I, we um we can talk about it. So um for um the chart review brief history, they were diagnosed at age 24, uh, multiple medications in the past, but currently on a regimen um, that they and their um, rheumatologist report have um, their disease quiescent and occasional morning hand stiffness. They're on methotrexate 15 once, day, once weekly and folic acid one milligram daily. Um, the first question was, what should they do regards to their medication? Our group thought that um, would likely need to stop the methotrexate given the teratogenicity in, in pregnancy and then consider another medication. Um, for the question about what additional lab work should we get closer to conception? So um, in addition to the usual um, pregnancy labs that we talked about in the previous question, uh, the CBC, LFT, BMP, UA, um, also getting um, ESR and CRP to confirm that they're truly in quiescent disease, um, getting a folate level and see if they're deficient. Um, there's some questions about what rheumatological markers should be obtained in the setting of RA, um, whether we want to go ahead with the ANA reflex panel, uh, anti-rheumatoid factor, anti-CCP, anti-double-stranded DNA, um, and then what additional labs needed to calculate the disease severity scores. And then question three was what recommendations change if you learned that they had a miscarriage when they were 22. We were thinking about also getting um, anti-phospholipid panel as well. Was there anything else from our group? Awesome. Yeah, if anyone has anything, I'd feel free. But thank you so much, Devin. That was wonderful. And I will highlight, again, some things um, that you mentioned. Um, and answer some questions that you had as well. So for the lab screening in RA, um, so to your point about whether or not, or what screening you should get with re related to their disease process, again, I think you, um, or kind of the school of thought in rheumatology that I've learned is only getting labs for something that like your is going to change your management. And so I think it'd be really reasonable to get an ESR and CRP um, if there's any question about like if their symptoms have worsened or not. But if they're reporting like their symptoms are con like totally well controlled, they're not really having any stiffness or joint pain, I don't think you even really need to recheck it. Um, but again, you can always coordinate, like send a message to a rheumatology and if there's any concern about it. The big thing um, that the American College of Rheumatology wants everyone to have checked is, again, just the anti-SSA and anti-SSB um, as far as lab work. So um, I get, for patients even not with lupus, they can still carry these specific antibodies. And again, they pose a risk um, to the pregnancy and the fetus. So you want to have these ideally checked um, just before or early in pregnancy. And then to your point, um, thinking about what what it might change if um, this individual had had a miscarriage at a younger age, you know, miscarriage is, is common in the general population. Um, there's more and more data about that. But I think knowing that they're at a higher risk for an autoimmune process, I would I would seriously consider um, sending the antiphospholipid panel on them um, because of the morbidity that's associated with it in pregnancy. And then just like you said, methotrexate, not so safe in pregnancy. And so they should be off of any teratogen for three months. But this is where you're really, again, going to be like quarterbacking that care, working with the rheumatologist saying, hey, they're telling me this thing. Um, I see they're stable on this medication. Can we come up with a plan or like have them see you to switch them to something safe in pregnancy? And then with that, you want them to be really diligent about their folic acid supplementation. So while they're still on it, they need to stay on that one milligram. But once they're completely off, they can go back to what ACOG recommends for all um, people who can become childbearing, which is 400 micrograms. Okay, questions about that one before we talk about case three. Oh, um, I, I guess that was the, to, the question would be, what would be the next choice of um, 
uh, the disease modifying med if methyltrexate wouldn't be used? Mm. Yeah, honestly, not totally sure because I'm not a rheumatologist. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't even know if I should take a stab because I'm not sure, but I will say that like TNF inhibitors are safe in pregnancy. I didn't talk about that. So, um, if they're all thinking about it, that might be something they would think about. Thank you, Leah. Okay. Um, someone who had case three want to read and go through and, I should not be starting rumors that Selena Gomez is trying to get pregnant, but I just love her and she has lupus. I can read it. So Selena is a 30 year old woman with a history of SLE who's actively trying to get pregnant. I was in group five, but I don't have the word document. Um, I can back you up on that if you okay. want. Um, so chart review for her, um, she's had lupus for about 10 years. It's always been pretty well controlled aside from a male R rash. Um, in her chart, you do find a prior ANA that was showed she was positive for anti-DS DNA and anti-SSA. Does not comment about SSB or other things on the panel. Um, meds for her, she's on hydroxychloroquine 200 milligrams daily. But on the med rec, she reports that she stopped taking it after she went to a forum that told her she shouldn't be on that while pregnant. Um, so the three main questions that we wound up having were, what do we tell her about hydroxychloroquine until she can get to her rheumatologist? What lab work should we do today? And then what additional medication might you suggest when she does conceive, even before her first OB or MFM appointment? And the hint for us was, we haven't talked about it yet. Thanks, Ruth. What was what were y'all's group's thoughts? Frankly, I was personally going to do some begging to get her to uh, take hydroxychloroquine and be just like, it's actually so good for you. Yes, correct. And then any um, lab work that you're you were thinking about. So we were actually kind of going back and forth on this a little bit um, because we do have a positive anti-SSA. So we're just like, yes, we would be using hydroxychloroquine. Like that's great for you. We weren't sure that getting an SSB would actually change our management. Um, also based on her prior lab work, weren't really clear whether or not she's had one in the past. And if she had, eh, it's positive for life. Like, what are we going to do? Um, but we would want to get uh, antiphospholipid and a couple of the other things. Awesome. Um, thank you so much. And I will highlight some things that you said. Um, so correct. Yeah. Once either or is positive, if they've ever had it, you're going to treat them the same. So knowing that part in their history, um, means that you don't need to test again and that they should be on hydroxychloroquine. They um, should be followed by an M MFM. They should be anyways, um, and be doing the, the recommended monitoring um, for that. The other thing, the thing that I did was a leading question because I we had not talked about it yet is um, specifically for patients with lupus, um, all patients, regard again, regardless of what antibodies they have, regardless of their disease activity, they should be started on low dose. So 81 milligrams of aspirin in pregnancy. Um, and this is best before 16 weeks. So again, an important part of education, because oftentimes patients, there is some lag time getting in to see these specialists. Um, as soon as they find out they're pregnant, they should be started on aspirin. Leah, is there any benefit to like patients who are trying to become pregnant with lupus, like just having them start a baby aspirin? Yeah. Um, really good question. And I was trying to find the answer to this and honestly, un unclear. I think, um, that I guess we, there's no dedicated sign on this, but, um, something that 
I would do is try and actually get these patients into MFN, like establish with them early, right? There's no reason why as an internist, you can't just start that referral process if you already know if it's going to take some time and they might have specific recommendations about starting while can, um, trying to conceive versus um, otherwise. It and does seem, oh, sorry. Sorry, Leah, I was just going to say it started at 12 weeks, like most people to prevent preeclampsia and preterm delivery or just started once they get pregnant. Started once they get pregnant versus okay. starting when they're trying to conceive. Got it. Okay. Um, and, and that's the part where just like the specialist would really be able to determine, but for everyone, as soon as they're pregnant with lupus, yeah, they should be on it. Oh, and then question from Tinny, um, what's the specific benefit of aspirin? Um, preeclampsia reduction or just blank state reduction of everything. Yeah. Um, so preeclampsia reduction, and then also, um, kind of related to that thinking about preeclampsia specific, um, adverse pregnancy outcomes. So reduced risk of miscarriage and fetal loss is kind of the big, um, thing we think about. Really good questions. So again, this is a, a big topic that we are not necessarily the experts in, but there are some things that I think we can and should be able to know and do. So the big thing, just like from an education perspective for us is maybe not surprisingly, but patients with lupus, RA, and other rheumatic diseases are at an increased risk for adverse pregnancy outcomes. So we want to um, be really careful about our counseling. And then the more active a disease process is, it comes with increased risks. Um, so we want to optimize them there. And then your medication review is essential, um, both to get people off of medications if they're um, not ideal, but also to have people stay on ones that are really beneficial. And then if you're going to remember anything about lab work is basically always check for an anti-SSA or SSB unless it's already positive and probably um, checking for antiphospholipids um, for the better risk assessment. Any questions that I may or may not be able to answer? Oh, Devin so nice. And then just some references. Okay. Well, if you think of any, feel free to put them in the chat, but I think this is a good time for another break, Sarah. Sounds yeah. great. I have What's another it? question. What are the specific risks of like SSA and SSB in pregnancy? I think we all know like the antiphospholipid mm. causes like the pregnancy loss, but I'm not as familiar with the SSA and SSB. Yeah. Um, great question. I guess I only kind of alluded to it. So big thing is thinking about congenital heart block and then neonatal lupus are the biggest risks. Um, so then what, what we are not really ordering, but what they do as far as the monitoring is, um, they're getting fetal echoes, um, every certain number of weeks is the big thing. Got it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Just, it's helpful to be able to tell a patient why you're getting labs. Yeah. Um, I have a question, Leah. Great presentation, by the way. Um, if a patient has lupus and doesn't have a positive anti-SSA or SSB, just a positive anti-DS DNA, and it's been quiescent for like over a year, and they wanted to get off the Plaquenil, even though it's safe in pregnancy, would you say that that's probably safe to do because it seems like their lupus is in remission, or are there is it even if your lupus is on in remission, you should probably still be on black vanilla because pregnancy increases the risk for lupus flares. Mm -hmm. Um, so I guess kind of two answers to that question. So one, I would say if like, if you're making a decision about like whether to stop something for like their like primary rheumatic disease process that I like, I would defer to their rheumatologist. Um, that being said, if they've, even if they've had a negative SSA or SSB, I would check again if they're closer to conception because let's say their rheumatologist is like, 
don't know. So let's say you did that lab work, you got the SSA and SSB and the rheumatologist is like, yeah, like for your lupus, I don't think you need to be on hydroxychloroquine. Sure. But if they have that antibody, that's a reason to start people on it. So once someone has that antibody, like they'll, they'll put them on Plaquenil specifically. Um, so that might impact their management during pregnancy even more. Does that make sense? Yeah, I like, I don't know about like lupus specifically in pregnancy, which is why I asked, but I think from working with rheumatologists, what I've seen is, is that if somebody's symptoms are in remission and then they'll normally get like a C3 and if that's normal and if the anti-DSDNA level has gone down, they'll sometimes trial people off of the medication. But um, that's like a good point that getting the SSA and SSB, even if it wasn't positive before, is a good idea before stopping if they're thinking about conceiving. Yeah, that makes sense to me. Well, why don't we take a break till 1050 and then we'll come back for the last section. Okay.